Christmas, almost here, quick poll of the crowd here today. <clears throat> How many of you are a fan of the Hallmark Christmas movie? Just a quick show of hands here. You're a fan of the Hallmark Christmas movie. All right, so true confession here. I hate, I hate the Hallmark Christmas movie. Now, that is, I don't mean any offense by that. You're welcome to love the Hallmark Christmas movie. In fact, in fact, I kind of really dislike almost every movie made by Christians. And you're like, oh, pastor, how could you dare? And here's why, here's why. Now, hear me in this. They are the sitcom of the Christian faith because by the end of the movie, Everything is wrapped up, everything is perfect, and nobody's sad, and if you are, you're probably Scrooge. Yes, and so I watch these movies, and I'm waiting for reality to dawn on these people, which is to say the world doesn't work that way. <laughs> You can't get to the end of the 30 minutes or the hour and 30 minutes or the two hours and 30 minutes and have everything wrapped up perfect and everybody's happy and God bless us, everyone, right? It just, it doesn't work that way. That is not how life works. Now, that's just me. That's just me, all right? So I'm not here to preach against the Hallmark Christmas movie, but I am here to preach what God's Word says, right? And so you and I have been waiting our entire lives for the end of this Hallmark Christmas movie that we call life, which, which is not to say the end of our lives, but it is to say Christ's coming, right? That when Christ comes, then everything will be right. But until then, these Christmas movies are a lie. I'm just telling you folks, life doesn't work that way. So then you're thinking to yourself, all right, well, what do you like, Pastor Jonathan? We just watched a movie at my house just yesterday. It's one of our favorite movies as a family. And the kids are like, can we watch this movie? It's a, it's a, little mo it's a movie about a little girl made by Pixar. If you've got Disney+, Plus, you could see it. And hopefully you've all seen this movie because it's a great movie. It's called Inside Out. You ever seen that movie? Inside Out? With a little girl, she's got the, the emotions in her head, and they're crazy. They're crazy, right? And so the whole movie is... Uh, is all of us, the audience, coming to terms with the fact that life is not all happy. That sometimes things happen and the required emotional response is what? If you've seen the movie, you know what I'm talking about. Sadness. Sadness. In fact, this, this key turning point in the movie is the little emotion joy Saying out loud, when sadness happens, help comes. This is profound. And I'm going to tell you, folks, Disney Pixar didn't learn this just yesterday. They learned this from the Bible. Now, unconsciously and unintentionally, they are telling us the way the world works, which is to say, Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. You will. It's not going to be a Hallmark Christmas movie, folks. <laughs> you're going to wish it was, and you're going to watch it on your TV, and you're going to say to yourself, wouldn't it be wonderful if life worked like that? And yes, it would be wonderful if life worked like that, but in this world, you will have trouble. And so when the sadness is present when you let it be real in the movie the little joy character she makes the sadness character stand in a little circle and she's not allowed to come out of this circle but the whole movie sadness is trying to help she's trying to say hey hey the little girl needs help and what happens is what happens in the movie and if you haven't seen the movie i'm ruining it for you so but you had your shot all right this movie's been out for a long time what happens is Anger, fear, and disgust take over. Anger, fear, and disgust take over because sadness doesn't get to do her job. Now, 
This is not a movie about, this is not a sermon about a movie. This is not a sermon about Pixar. This is a sermon series about how life works and how the Christian life is supposed to work. And this whole series, Son of Righteousness Rise, is based on a single verse that we find in Malachi 4.2, which says this, you who revere, who fear my name, for you, the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in its rays. And I, I like to joke and say it's, it's, it's the, the anti-verse right, of the Bible, the sun will come out tomorrow, right, except it, it may not be tomorrow, and the sun may not rise the next day, and the next day, and the next day, and so when does the sun rise? Well, the sun rises when God shows up, and, and he started to show up when the babe was born, and people started to say, hey, the sun is coming up, the sun, and this is what we're looking at, we're looking at passages where when the baby Jesus was born, when God started to show up, but he's, he's, see, the sun's just peeked over the horizon. And we must wait. We, the people of God, must wait for the full sunrise, which has yet to happen. When Christ returns, right? I mean, what are we waiting for if it's not for Christ to return? The book ends. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. And we just sang, oh, come. O oh, come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel. We're not talking about Israel, the nation over there. We're talking about your people. God, ransom us. Redeem us. You say, oh, but Jesus already came. Yes, Jesus already came. And what has God's sacrifice purchased for God? He's purchased the redemption of our souls, you see. And you say, well, that's all that matters. Not to God. You see, because God didn't come to save souls. He came to save all of you. And we are waiting for Christ to return to set free our bodies. To set free this world that's under a curse. To finally come and stay. That's what we are waiting for. And so your Hallmark movies, as fun as they are, as silly as, you know, like, you know, eye-rolling as they are, they're depicting a life that is not real, whereas you and I know very well we need God's healing. We need God's healing, not just for souls. And praise God, He's given me forgiveness for sins. He's given me hope everlasting that he will finally redeem our bodies and the broken world, the broken cosmos where sin and hurricanes, tornadoes cut through uh, small Kentucky towns where cancer steals life, where little children die. He's going to ransom this world and that's what we're waiting for. Amen? Otherwise, we're not. And if we're not waiting, well, then maybe we think we've got it all. And maybe we think the Hallmark movies have it right. Well, speak for yourself. <laughs> I'm waiting for God to take the hurting and make them whole in Christ. That's what I'm waiting for. That's what I'm longing for. And we're going to look at a woman in Scripture who was waiting for the same thing. So turn with me now to the third in the series of three messages on three people who were waiting for God to do what God was going to do and what God, we're still waiting for God to do. This is Luke chapter 2, verse 36. Last week, well actually two weeks ago, we learned that Mary was waiting for God to fill the hungry. And that is in fact God's plan, to fill the hungry. And so what have we received so far? Well, the Scripture says we've received a taste, that the Holy Spirit is a taste of the full meal that God has in store for His people when Christ returns. Taste and see that the Lord is good, but just a taste, because the meal, the feast we're waiting for will only happen when Christ returns. And then last week we learned, as we looked at Simeon, that Christ comes to give the orphan a home, to give the homeless a home. And that's what we're waiting for. We're waiting for him to finally come home. Jesus to come home to his people. He's Emmanuel, God with us. And yet there he is over there. We have his spirit with us. But we're waiting for God to finally come home. So for now we have the spirit within us. But I'm ready to take hold of Jesus 
like this with my hands, like Simeon did when he held Jesus in his hands. That's what I'm waiting for. That's what I'm longing for. Don't know about you. This week, we're going to meet Anna. Verse 36, chapter 2, Luke's gospel. Here we go. There was a prophet. Your version might say prophetess. Yeah, girl prophet. What of it? A prophet, Anna, the daughter of Penuel of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. <laughs> very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, and then she was a widow until she was 84. Probably married around 14, 15, 16. You do the math. Some of you are celebrating 50 years of marriage. She's right around 50 years of widowhood. She was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple, but worshiped night and day, fasting and praying. Coming up to them, this is up to uh, Jesus' parents, right? And the baby Jesus who was there for a circumcision, day eight of his life. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. They were looking forward, right? They were waiting, they were longing, they were hoping, and she said, hey, everybody, let me tell you about this little baby boy. Let me tell you. That's our passage. There's not a whole lot there, but there is a whole lot there. Who is this Anna? Well, let's just call her a lady in waiting. Anna's a prophetess. And we learn a few things about her, biographical details, which maybe you're not as interested in, but they do tell us a lot. Anna, the daughter of Penuel, which means the face of God. Her dad's name was the face of God. And in Scripture, the face of God very often is, um, is like the sun rising, right? May his face shine upon you and give you peace. The sun of righteousness rises, and when the sun rises, they look, if you've got you to make crops, <laughs> you need that sun to be up. You need God to smile on you and let the sun shine. Her dad was her sunshine, but he's long gone by now. In fact, all of her people are gone. You see, because Anna is from the tribe of Asher, which was one of the ten lost tribes. Only two tribes survived the exile, Judah and Benjamin. The tribe of Asher, Anna's family, her tribe, her people, are long gone. And Luke knows this. Luke knows that only two tribes came back from, it, from exile. The rest of Israel, the northern kingdom, which was comprised of all the other tribes aside from Judah and Benjamin, they're gone. They're gone. And the only thing left of them are the dreaded Samaritans, the people who had interbred with the Gentiles. And they had a kooky kind of version of, of, of religion, and they were despised by the Jews. But Anna had remained a faithful Jew. And I don't know, maybe she had been in Jerusalem, or her family had been in Jerusalem when, when uh, Judah was carried off into exile. I don't know. But somehow she survived, and she remembered the tribe that she had come from, her family had descended from those who went into exile and who came back. And we're not exactly sure how, but here's the point. Anna has no living family. She's a widow. Her husband's dead. Her parents are long gone. She's 84 years old, right? They're not still around. And if she is a widow devoted, devoted to the Lord, then in order to qualify for that in Israel, you've got to have no living family. Nobody take care of you. No husband, that's clear. She's a widow. And no kids. So in those seven years that she was with her husband, we don't know his name, before he passed, no kids. Or if they did have kids, they too passed. Anna's alone. But is she? Because you see, every, every day and every night, she's in the temple, worshiping God, fasting and praying. I've told you before that fasting is the way we express in physical terms our longing for God. 
God, we want you to come and fill us up. So we're not going to eat food for this meal or for the next meal or for the next, perhaps. However long the fast, it is an expression during that season of fasting where I'm not eating physical food that I am saying to myself, I do not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. I am fasting because I'm saying, I want to be filled with you. And that's what she does. And God has smiled upon Anna, and he's given her a job. Anna, you're going to speak for me. You're going to speak for me, Anna. That's what a prophetess is. That's what a prophet is, right? Somebody who speaks for God. Who says, hey, I'm going to tell you what, what God's saying. Now, they never, speak, they never speak contrary to God's word. Otherwise, they're a false prophet, right? But Luke says she's devout. Luke says she does speak for God. Whether the people listen or not, she speaks for God. And when God shows up, she recognizes him and says, hey, y'all, come on over here. I found him. Anna's life is an expression of longing. Number one, Anna decided many years before, not to go out and find another man. Now, this is neither praiseworthy or not. For a woman who is a widow, whether she decides to go get married or not, it's neither praiseworthy nor unpraiseworthy. If your spouse passes, Paul says, you're free to remarry, right? Because it's till death do us part. But Anna said... I'm not going to look for another man. And not all widows could find men. So so if you were were a man and you were looking for a woman, chances are you were looking past the widows. You were looking for them young honeys. You know what I mean? But whatever the reason, Anna has devoted her life to the Lord. And her expression of fasting, expression of worship... Her day in, day out worship of the Lord in the temple is the way that Anna expressed her desire for God to come and heal her brokenness. You think that by becoming one flesh with another person in marriage, that if that person were to die and go to be with the Lord, or if there were a divorce, that you come out unscathed, that you come out perfectly fine? Well, I mean, some in our world would believe that. Well, finally rid of that fella. Now I can be happy. But that's not true, is it? You can't become one flesh with another, and that person die and go to be with the Lord or somewhere else, and not be broken by death, by loss. Anna is broken by her loss. But you wouldn't know it to look at her, would you? And that's not because she's in a Hallmark Christmas movie, is it? Because in a Hallmark Christmas movie, she'd have found a man by the end of the episode. You know I'm telling the truth. And we're watching this movie and we're saying, Anna, how many years has it been? Find a man already. Let this movie end with a happy ending. Come on. And Anna says, no, 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 no. I'm longing for the Lord. I'm waiting for the Lord. Now, if you decided, no, I I do want to remarry, fine. It's not like Anna is more holy because she decides, I don't need another man in my life except God. It's It's not that she's more holy, but it is clear that Anna is waiting. She's longing patiently for healing she knows only God can bring. But here's the other thing that Anna's longing for. She's longing for God's people to do the same thing she's doing. You say, well, Pastor, how can you know that? We don't know what Anna wants, what she's waiting for, what she's longing for. Well, here's the thing about being a prophet. If you're going to be a prophet, you've got to be concerned about the things God's concerned about. If you're going to speak to God's people, then you've got to speak what God is saying to God's people. And what God's, peop- what God's people need to hear from God is, wait on me. Wait on me. And here's what the scripture says about the prophet. Surely the sovereign Lord does nothing without revealing his plan to his servants, the prophets. There's a prophet who spoke those words. 
So you see, Anna, like every other prophet that was ever called out, that was ever commissioned by God, is the one who believes she's going to hear what God has to say to God's people and she's going to speak it. Doesn't mean he's going to say everything to her. But clearly, he spoke the word made flesh. He spoke the word made flesh when that baby walked in and she said, hey, everybody, everybody, everybody that's waiting for God, come on over here. See this little baby boy. You say, yeah, but pastor, the prophets ended with the old covenant. Well, there was a big long season where there were no prophets. But let's be real. (laughs) The New Testament gives great credence to the office of prophet. Christ himself gave the prophets, so along with the apostles and the evangelists and the pastors and the teachers. But he himself gave the prophets to equip his people, Paul says, for works of service, so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature. Part of the role of the prophets is to help build up the body. He said, I don't believe that. What, you disagree with Paul? <laughs> okay, good luck with that. Until we reach Uh, Unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. And you say, well, where are the prophets in the New Testament? All right, all right. Acts 13, 1, calm down. Now at the church, in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. Barnabas, Simeon called uh, Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. The Saul that becomes Paul, right? There are prophets in the church at Antioch. And and, and in case you were wondering, were they only dudes? No. There were girl prophets. Remember Philip the Evangelist, right? The guy who witnesses to the Ethiopian unit? Well, apparently he grew up and had some girls. When they reached the house, when they reached Caesarea, we stated the house of Philip the Evangelist, who was one of the seven, one of the original seven deacons. Now he's living in Caesarea many years later. He had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. What's the job of the prophet, you may wonder? The one who prophesies, Paul says, speaks to people for their strengthening, encouraging, and comfort. All the things that God wants to speak to his people, these are the things the prophet speaks. You thought prophet's job was to tell the future. Well, if that's what God wants to say, that's what the prophet's supposed to say. But no, the job of the prophet is to speak on God's behalf. What I'm doing right now is speaking on God's behalf. And if you don't believe that, what in the world are you doing listening to me? And you say, well, I thought only men could do that. Really? I guess that's why Luke put on it in the text. I don't want my girls growing up thinking God won't speak through them. You want your girls growing up thinking God won't speak through them? There's some folks in this world who might want to put that on our daughters and our granddaughters. But God himself chooses who will speak for him. I don't know if that was applause starting or what, but one clap. Good job. But whoever the prophet, male or female, his or her job is to do what Paul says the prophet's supposed to do. To speak to people for their strengthening, encouraging, and comfort. And if that is what God wanted Anna to do, then you better believe Anna wanted God's people waiting on strength, encouragement, and comfort from God. So what did Anna long for? Well, she longed for God to heal her brokenness. And as a prophet, she wanted God's people to wait on God. And we know something else. Because Luke tells us that she went around speaking of the Christ child to everyone who was waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. And in this case, Jerusalem is a stand-in for Israel, which is a stand-in for God's people. Right? 
everybody among the people of God who were waiting for God to redeem them, to purchase them out of their captivity, to purchase them out, not just their captivity to Rome, you see, but their captivity to the enemy, their captivity to sin, their captivity to the greatest enemy we've ever known, which is death. We're waiting for God to redeem us from sin and from hell and from death and the grave. And if you're waiting for that, then Anna wants you to know he's here. He's here. And she wants God to restore his broken people. All of us. All of us. Here's what Anna wants you to know. Jesus comes to those who long for God's healing touch. I uh, debated whether to share this story with you or not because sometimes I share illustrations and I worry you miss the point. And you'll get fixated on some other detail that that I'm not asking you to look at. And this is kind of what happens when we read the Bible, right? We get fixated on this and God's saying, hey, look here. And we're like, no, no, no. I want to read this part right here. Go away, God. You're bothering me. Now, I'm not God, so you don't have to listen to everything I say. <laughs> Some of you are like, well, it's a good thing. But this is a, this is a part of, part, story that's part of my life. So you, you know, I've told the story before that, um, that I was born out of wedlock. And I didn't find out until I was around 40. So this is going back about seven, eight, nine years ago that my mother's mother, so the mother of the woman who carried me to term, at one point during the pregnancy, recommended to my mom, maybe you should go ahead and just terminate the pregnancy. Now, I didn't learn that until many, many years later, and, you know, the only thing I ever knew about my grandmother was she loves me and she loves Jesus. In fact, when I was born, it was... Uh, it was my grandmother, my grandfather, my mom's parents that basically took the two of us in, my mother and me. And it was just the two of us. And they took, they, they took us in. So when I learned this, I thought, well, that's really strange. <laughs> because I, I, I'm thinking about all these years that I had when she's passed on. She's with the Lord now. I thought all these years that I knew my grandmother, I never had a hint that she would have ever said anything like that. Now, I know, you know, as a political issue, this is very uh, controversial. To me, it's not controversial at all. If, if my mom had listened to her mom and gotten an abortion, I wouldn't be your pastor right now. <laughs> uh, these four children wouldn't exist, right? So for me, it's very uncomplicated. Now, I believe God can take even the life that is worth less and make it worth something. And what you and I cannot see, which is to say the future, God knows exactly what he can do, and he is capable of what we can never ask or imagine. And for that reason, it's very clear to me that while some people give in to fear, as God's people, we should hold on to faith. Now, if you ever listen to someone who spoke to you like my grandmother spoke to my mother, there is redemption and forgiveness. I have no interest in condemning you. In the same way, I had no interest in condemning my grandmother. It wasn't like I went up to her and said, Grandma, you may be about the same age as Anna at the time. You may be a senior saint, but I ain't got something to say. No, never. Because you see, that momentary lapse of faith that she experienced, she was Christian at the time, that momentary, and this is why, for me, it's such a tricky political issue, because it's so easy for you and me to say what other people ought to be doing, but when it hits your home, that's when your faith really gets tested, you know what I mean? And that was true for my grandmother and for my mother, and I praise God I'm still here. <laughs> Whew. But my, mother, my grandmother, she didn't know who I was. But here's something else. 
My grandmother had been raised herself without her father. When she was three years old, he died suddenly. And she was raised by a stepfather. But in that moment, when my mom came home and said, there's a baby growing in me, you better believe that it was my grandmother's experience of having lost her father and now looking at her daughter who might be raising a child without a father thinking, well, maybe he or she would be better off than what I went through without my dad. Maybe that's what went through her head. I don't know. We never talked about it until the day before she passed. I went to visit her as she lay in hospice. I traveled from New York to North Carolina, and I had no intention of bringing anything up, (laughs) that's for sure. I had already forgiven my grandmother. And as I sat in her room, she had a terrible bruise on her face because she had fallen and this huge hematoma on the side of her face, and she held her shaking hand up over her face, embarrassed. She knew who I was, but at this moment, her, her, her brain and her mouth weren't connecting, and she couldn't speak with any clarity. Her mind was still active. She did crossword puzzles every day of her life, just about. The sweetest lady you ever met, but here she is hiding from her grandson in shame. And I tried to talk to her a little bit, and she tried to say something, but nothing came out. I couldn't understand a word she said. So we sat there and watched, I don't know, The Price is Right for a little while. And then the aide came in and said, it's time for her to, to rest now. And I thought, oh, okay, okay, Grandma, I love you. Gave her a hug and a kiss, and I went out and met with my uh, aunts and uncles who were, who were there waiting. And a few minutes later, It was time for me to go. I had to go to get to the airport to fly back to New York where I was living at the time. And I said, I'm just going to go back and and say goodbye. So I went back in and she was laying on the bed and she was fast asleep. And I just thought, I'm just going to pray. I'm just going to pray over. And I started praying. Lord Jesus, I thank you so much for my grandmother. I thank you for the life that she gave me, a life full of love. And I thank you, and I remember saying these words, and as the words came out of my mouth, I thought, why did I say that? And I said, Father, you are father to the fatherless. And they hooked in my soul as they came out, and I felt a tremble in my voice, and I opened my eyes, and I looked at my grandmother, and her eyes were wide open and bright, and she reached out my hand, and she said the first words I could understand. She said, I'm sorry. And I burst into tears because I knew what she was saying. She wasn't sorry about the bruise. She wasn't sorry about her inability to speak. She was sorry about everything. I knew it in my soul that this is what she was saying. And until that day, she had not been able to say those words because she'd not been able to face her brokenness and her shame and her fear. But in that moment, she said, I'm sorry. And I said, Grandma, I love you. She passed the next day. I went to the airport and I could barely see my eyes streaming with tears and I knew and I said the reason you gave me those words is because I was fatherless and you became my father she was fatherless and you became her father you truly do heal the broken and you just healed my grandmother from this hurt she's been carrying my entire life. That's a long time to wait for healing, isn't it? Some wounds, folks, some wounds, you get a cut on your arm and a couple weeks later, you don't even see the mark. But some wounds just don't heal with time and a Band-Aid. Jesus, however, comes to all who are waiting on God's healing touch. He met my grandmother in that room. He will meet you wherever you are. I 
Anna, hopelessly devoted to the God who heals the broken. And on their behalf, she is waiting, and she is longing, and she is praying. This is what Paul says about the unmarried woman or the virgin. She is concerned about the Lord's affairs. Her aim is to be devoted to the Lord in both body and spirit. And he says the same thing about the man who is unmarried, that he can fully or she can fully devote him or herself to the Lord in body and spirit. He's not saying don't get married. But he is saying, if that's not your path, it's so that you can be fully devoted to the Lord in body and spirit. And I want to show you what Anna was waiting on and what you and I are waiting on if we revere the Lord, if we're waiting for the sun to rise. This is what Jesus says, there will be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars on the earth. Nations will be in anguish and perplexity at the roaring and tossing of the sea. Sounds pretty right. People will faint from terror. Sounds right. Apprehensive of what is coming on the world for the heavenly bodies will be shaken. And at that time they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and with great glory. And when these things begin to take place, you stand up and lift your heads because your redemption is drawing near. The wait will be over. The Son will will be risen and until that day just like Anna be patient until the Lord's coming see how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop patiently waiting for the autumn and the spring rains you too be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. The sun will rise for all who wait patiently for his healing. The last thing I want to say is how you wait. Paul says, if we're distressed, he says, if I'm distressed, it's for your comfort, it's for your salvation. He says, If we, if I am comforted, it's for your comfort. So that you too will have patient endurance through the same suffering. What he's saying is, when you hurt with the hurting and the broken and those who are longing for God to come and heal their wounds, when you hurt with them you fulfill Christ's healing mission. We sat this week with Dr. Grant Scarborough, founder of Mercy Med Clinic, whose mission is to heal the broken. Body, soul, spirit. Listen to what he said. named it Mercy Med because I love the story of the Good Samaritan. Uh, you know, he talks about someone who's left for dead and finally one person picked him up and took him to him and then just say, hey, take care of him, but here's money and I bring you extra money if you need it. And, they, and Jesus said, which showed mercy? And they said, that guy. He said, go and do likewise. And so all throughout scripture, you see people go, Jesus going and doing likewise to all these people hurting in the community. And the story of the Good Samaritan is a great story because it's about a person who was sick on the side of the road in really a scary part of town back then. It wasn't a safe area. Um, if we're supposed to go and do likewise, it means the same for us. So sometimes we may have to go to areas that's not the safest to try to pick people up and help them. And sometimes you do that, you get taken advantage of. But our theory is that if you don't get taken advantage of from time to time, we're not helping the right people. And so we're going we're gonna to allow that so we can help those folks in need. So. Um, yeah, we just have to go and do likewise. Well, our mission statement is that we exist to proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and demonstrate His love. So it's a Christian nonprofit. And so for us, we proclaim Jesus Christ, but we demonstrate it by using our hands and feet and, and, and touching people and loving people. And when homeless folks come in, even taking care of their feet. So we want to proclaim and demonstrate the love of Christ by providing affordable quality health care to the physical, emotional, spiritual needs. So when someone comes to the door, those are the things I look at, it's the physical needs. And many times they come in with masses that they've had no idea where to go to for years. Um, It's actually very sad. 
They'll come in with blood pressure or blood sugar uh, very elevated, and our job is to love them by trying to control those things. Emotionally, uh, in the community here, there are a lot of folks that have had physical abuse or sexual abuse or mental illness or addiction. Uh, and so our job is to engage our friends in that area as well. And we have counselors here and a, an addiction counselor here uh, to try to do that. And lastly, spiritual. Like I feel like the greatest need for everybody is that they need to meet the great physician. So yeah, I'm a physician, but there's someone much greater than me that I really want them to know. And so those are the needs that we look at for folks in the community. Well, I would say that uh, so often we think, oh, if I can just get to this point, <clears throat> I can really love the poor well. And so often I think we think so far ahead, if I could just get to there. And I'm not sure if Jesus cares about that. I really think Jesus wants to know, will we be faithful today? Yeah, yeah, he'll take care of that. He promises to take care of that. But will we be faithful today? No matter where we are in life, no matter if we're just in school or just getting through school, if we're not faithful today and just loving those around us, we're not gonna miraculously become faithful to love the poor when the opportunity shows up. So I do think it starts you know, bit by bit. Hey, let's, be, let's love the folks around us. And as we're doing that, then let's look for other opportunities to love people. It is a ministry. And I'll start right there because uh, we do believe in uh, the power of prayer. I know everybody says that, but we really do believe that. Please pray for us. Um, it, it's sometimes hard, it's sometimes challenging, it's sometimes hard on our hearts to see folks who have health conditions that we have trouble taking care of. Um, there's some things that we can't fix, uh, and it's, it's sometimes really hard on our soul, so I would really encourage you to, to pray for us. Um, we would love for folks to come and volunteer as well. We're a little bit different, though, than maybe a, a place we can go put, you know, like a soup kitchen or something like that. We really need folks, because we're, we're a full-fledged clinic, to come along beside us and, and be willing to volunteer for like a day a week or, or really commit to kind of learn a little bit about a skill that we have to have so we can work here. But we are looking for folks like that. Yeah, there is a big need here, and the reality is I really love people at the same time. Uh, and the bottom line is the biggest need for them is the same biggest need for us is that we need Jesus. Um, and sometimes we might have different idols and everything, but the reality is what they need more than physical care or anything else is they need Christ. Um, but specifically in my poorer communities, uh, there's all types of barriers that people have to overcome to get their basic health care needs met. Um, there's so much sometimes dignity that is lost when they can't get the things that they need. Um, and so there seems to be a little bit of hopelessness in a lot of folks who are trying to, be able to get what they need to kind of make that next step in their life. But at the same time, and, and this is what's so amazing as me, is, is I see a lot of faith and a lot of courage in a lot of people that I see. Um, and sometimes they really inspire me by how much they love Jesus when they have nothing else to hold on to. Uh, and so often I find myself like trying to hold on to all this other stuff and just have a little bit of Jesus when really... I meet mean, people that all they have is Jesus, and they're so at peace and so uh, just just able to relax in, in their God. Um, I read a book that said one time, until you realize that you're broken as the person you're trying to help, you'll never be much good. Um, and so it made me realize that when I go and help my friends, that I'm just as broken as they are, and I can receive help from them and give it at the same time, and I, and I love that. Until we realize we are just as broken, we will never love like Christ. I want to invite you to bow your heads with me. <clears throat> Christ, I thank, Lord Jesus, I thank you for Grant Scarborough, for Dr. Sarah Barr, for all of those who are ministering as your hands and feet through the Mercy Med Clinic. But Lord Jesus, <laughs> you've not called us all to be physicians, but you have called all of us to love the hurting, to love the broken, and to faithfully proclaim your healing. For those of us here today who are actively hurting and longing for healing, Father, show us that this is a place of safety, of forgiveness, of healing. Because you are in this place and you forgive all our sins. You heal all our diseases, whether in this life or the life to come. And so we come to you today. And for those of us, Father, who are, as far as we can tell, living in a Hallmark Christmas movie, everything's just 
hunky-dory. Wake us up. Help us to turn off the TV and live in the real world where real people really need you. And that you, Lord Jesus, are our happy ending. That when you come, all those who long for your appearing will be satisfied. We will be filled. We will be home eternally. And we will be whole in you. Until that day, teach us to wait. Teach us to long. Teach us to hope. Teach us to strive to remain devoted to the God who has promised to come and right all our wrongs to fix all our hurts and to heal us to the uttermost. We wait for you, Jesus. We long for you, Jesus. Even so, Lord Jesus, quickly come. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.